This is Join Us in France, episode 48. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And we welcome you to the Join Us in France travel podcast. Elise is a professional tour guide, art historian, and a really good storyteller. Yes. On today's show, we take you to the city of Foix. Foix. In the Ariège. Oui. Foix is a small city, around 10,000 inhabitants today, but it's full of history and has an impressive castle. Apparently, about 90,000 visitors go every yep. year. That's a lot yep. of people. It's a little bit of a hike. I've been there many times. We'll talk about it during the show. It's a, it's a very nice place. You'll find the show notes for this episode and all of our other episodes on joinusinfrance.com. If you're wondering what other places we've talked about on this show, go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash episodes or click on the blue button that says episodes map. Okay, let's do a little music and we'll get right back to foie. Okay, we're back. Today, I will take a minute at the end of the show to read some iTunes reviews because I haven't done anything with that for many, many episodes. Okay. And I think it's, it's lovely that people take the time to write us a review. So I will keep that for the end of the show. And would you believe it? We're, we got our first negative review. <sighs> that does happen. It does happen. So we'll... We'll talk about it at the end of the show. I also want to thank uh, listeners who help support the show by going to joinusinfrance.com forward slash Amazon to make their Amazon purchases. That's right. We've been making just a little bit of money, just enough to pay for the bandwidth for this show. It's very helpful. There is no obligation for you to do this, but if you do, we get a small commission. It does not cost you a penny more and it helps us keep the show on the road. All right. Thank you. Foie. Foie. Mm. Can Le I begin? I have to begin with this. Okay. <laughs> Il y avait, I, I tried to figure out if there was a way to translate this, but there isn't. But I have to do this anyway, okay? <laughs> Il y avait une fois dans la ville de Foie, un marchand de Foie, qui a dit, ma foi, c'est la première fois que je vends de Foie dans la ville de Foie. Oh, you got it almost right. Oh. You missed a bit. Il était une fois dans la ville de Foix, un marchand de Foix qui s'est dit « Ma foi, c'est bon. la première fois foie. et la dernière, ah, fois et la dernière fois que je vends du foie dans la ville de Foix. » Oh, God. <laughs> I almost got it right. So it's a, it's a French tongue twister. Okay. If what, you want to practice, this yes. is a good one. The, the reason where we're, we have to begin with this, and obviously we both had the same idea because <laughs> great minds think alike, of course. Uh, is because uh, this is a rhyme that is taught to children yeah. in school because France is a uh, French, pardon, French is a language that is filled with what is called homonyms. Yes. And a homonym means that there are words that are, in fact, pronounced the same that are written differently. Yes. And one of them is the name of this lovely little town in uh, the department of the Ariège, which is uh, one of the most southernmost of the departments in France because it's south of Toulouse and it's in the Pyrenees Mountains. Right. And the town is, name, the name of the town is Foix and it's written F-O-I-X. Yes. And in the Middle Ages, it was pronounced Foix. Well, there you go. I'm sure some so people So there you still are. <laughs> there you are. And in fact... Misguided uh, foreigners, the, maybe. <laughs> the people who live there are called Fuxian. And the oh, way that is written see, is... I didn't know that. Ah, but the I Fuxian. did. Fuxian. Uh, Fuxian or Fuxian. And that is written F-U-X-I-E-N if you're a boy. And if you X I E N N E, if you are a girl, yes. And it is very funny because uh, just the other day I bumped into one of my ex 
students. Uh, one of the students I, I had when I was uh, teaching at the art school here in Toulouse. He graduated. And uh, he graduated. <laughs> yes, indeed. And he's actually doing very well as a photographer, which was very nice. And we had a nice little conversation. And I happened to, uh, because he has a fairly strong accent, a fairly strong southern French accent, southern from this region, not Marseille, I asked him where he was originally from. And he said, I'm from Foix. Well, there you go. And uh, he was the one that reminded me that if you are from Foix, you are called a Fuxian. Fuxian. Uh, Fuxian. It starts with the name Fou, though, with a, with a sound Oh, uh, no, no. F-U, F-U-X-I-A-N. Oh, Fuxian. Fuxian. Oh, it's just your American accent. It's my American accent. It's not Fuxian, it's Fuxian. Fuxian, yes. Oh, Fuxian, Fuxian. Yes, okay. So, okay, then you can make don't a go joke crazy, everybody out there. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, <laughs> the town of Foix. Uh, it is uh, the, the department of the Ariège, just to situate everything. First of all, this is almost due south of Toulouse. It's actually 85 kilometers south of Toulouse. It's slightly southeast, but it's almost due south. Yeah. In the beginning of the Pyrenees Mountains, uh, the, it takes just about 50 minutes uh, to get there from Toulouse. Mm. There's a main road, the main highway that goes there. You can speed. also get there by, by train. Okay. Oh, I know how to go because I go there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it is the major city, it is the county seat, if you will, of the Department of the Ariège, which is now and has been for over a hundred years a relatively underpopulated uh, and agricultural department. But is, it, it is a region and the town of Foix, uh, both the town and the region, are places that have a wonderful, rich history yeah. and are very, very, very important in the history of the south of France and its relationship to the north and the story of how all of this area came to be part of the kingdom of France. Yeah. Uh, so the town uh, of Foix, as, as Annie mentioned, is just about 10,000 people year-round. In the summertime, it explodes because... It is the center of a region that people come to to go rafting, to go hiking, to go boating, and to do a lot of uh, exploring of the caves. And I will talk about that in a minute because one of the major uh, things that you can see in the area once you are in the town and staying in the town and having visited the town is uh, not only uh, to do go to do a lot of hiking and do a lot of the natural sites in the area, but it is the center of a very important part of the caves that have prehistoric art in them. So mm -hmm. it's very very uh, interesting as a Ooh, location. I wonder if you're going to mention my favorite one. And uh, the the we'll city see. itself. Have to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to wait and see. I'm going to leave that as a surprise. Just to, just to give people an idea, the the, the it's actually on the. Uh, again, as a lot of case, in a lot of these towns, it's where two rivers meet up. Yeah. One of them is a very big, important river, and that is the Ariège River, yeah. which is uh, basically a very large, fast-flowing river that is almost exclusively uh, melted snow waters. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of people like to do rafting and some kayaking on various parts of the river. And it meets up with a smaller river called the Arge, A-R-G-E-T, uh, which is just a confluent. It's just another small branch that okay. actually meets up just Never about just about where uh, the 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 city uh, meets up with the Otter Route and where you can see up on the top of the rock the very famous landmark, and the landmark is this fabulous castle. Right. And it's a castle that is actually a thousand years old. So uh, when people come to Foix, very often they come because they're on their way to do other things in the Pyrenees Mountains mm -hmm. or uh, to Spain. Or to Spain, or to go to Andorra, yeah. which is, uh, the, there's a big, big highway that, of course, keeps going into the Pyrenees and takes you out through the, the southeast. Uh, but, but it's a very wonderful place to stop. And now it's a place you can stop and spend a, a couple of nights and work your way out from there, doing hikes and local visits, because there's a lot to see in the local area. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, as is often the case, people rent houses or apartments in villages nearby and come in to the town mm -hmm. to visit the town or it's a place you come to spend the day and then you just go on from there if you go from Toulouse uh, there's a train uh, just about every hour hour and a half that goes to Foix and once you get out of the train station you can actually visit the town by foot so even if you don't have a car you can easily get to this 
place, which is in a fairly remote part of France in the beginning of the Pyrenees yeah. Mountains, you know. It's not a very industrialized area of France, compar- especially compared to Toulouse, which is, you know, has Airbus, has a lot right. of satellite industry, has a lot of industry, a lot of things happening. Right. Uh, by comparison, Foix is really sedate. It's very sedate. You know. Well, it, 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 it was always the center of agriculture, and it was never a highly industrialized yeah. area. However, in the valley of the Ariège, which runs, uh, instead of running straight south into the mountains, it actually turns and runs east, so it runs a little bit. Uh, there's a, th- there's a, a small town not far away called Tarascon. Uh, between Tarascon. Foi- Tarascon. Con. Tarascon. But then you'd say con. Tarascon. You have Tarascon. To. Tarascon. I have Ta- to. Foi- <laughs> Tarascon. Uh, uh, in between the two, uh, there actually is some industry, and uh, there's an aluminum factory which employs quite a few people. And there's a talc factory uh, because the hills... As in talc and powder? As in talc and powder, that's oh. right. Because the hills Didn't know that. in the area, uh, specifically the region right after Foix and going east as you head on the road, going out further towards eventually Aix-les-Thermes and then uh, eventually into Andorra. Yeah, I've been on that road But in between, uh, in between Foix and Tarascon and Aix-les-Thermes, uh, the hills are filled with talc. Oh. And well, so it's know. one of the major <laughs> European sites for producing, uh, excavating talc. Oh, wow. So there is actually some, some industry. It's not highly polluted. It's very interesting to know yep, that. Yep. And uh, it is a region that was largely abandoned in the 19th century. In fact, of the French population that emigrated to the United States, more than 50% are from the Ariège area. Oh, well, that's an interesting thing. It's very interesting thing to know. It's good. You know, even today, the Ariège is a little bit depressing at times, Uh, I have to say. See, I like it there. You like it, but your husband, you told me that he he thinks... Well, he... he, No, there are two things. (laughs) He doesn't doesn't think it's... uh, No, talking about the town of Foix, he doesn't think it's... It's that pretty. I happen to like it because I like the history attached to it. But yeah, I happen, is, I yes. happen to like the Ariège as a region, and uh, it, it's it's uh, it's just it, it's a sentimental feeling, and I'll tell you why. But yeah. it, it's uh, it's good for hikes. It's, it's, it's wonderful good for, for many hikes things. and the and the caves. And if the you're caves. There, if you're in the area with kids, it's really good to take right. them to all the cave stuff. Right. But but it's an area that's rich with history, and in fact. Foix is the, as I mentioned, it's the county seat. It's not the most, uh, it's not the largest city in terms of population. The, the largest city in terms of population is Pamiers, right. which is uh, about 15,000 people and growing very quickly. And is, is probably, it? oh yes, enormously. Why? Be- because a lot of high tech, because of the low property taxes and because they wanted to bring a young population into the Ariège department, which has lots of beautiful old little villages, but where other than vacation homes, most of it was just older people. Yeah, retirees. What has happened, and it's worked, is that there was a very big push to bring in uh, small, high-tech businesses. Hmm. And so Palmier is one of the fastest-growing small towns in France. Oh, wow. I would have never guessed yes. that. And it's it, also the birthplace of... Uh, Gabriel Forêt. Of Gabriel Forêt, yes. And, I love his and I, music. I'm, and just when I talk about the activities and, and festivals, I was going to mention it. Uh, the So it's actually an area that uh, a lot of French people come to for vacation. People who choose to go to the mountains, you have basically a choice. You can either go to the Alps or you can go into the Pyrenees. Yep. Now, a lot of people are from Toulouse and... Uh, the region around Toulouse, but it's also a region that has a lot of people from Paris and from northern France who want to go to a part of the countryside that is not as highly developed, is not expensive like parts of the Alps, and unlike parts like the Basque country, uh, is much more rustic and therefore, and really honestly, much more genuine in the sense that you don't yeah. have a huge uh, development. In fact, one of the biggest problems of the Ariège area and even around Foix, and I've spent a lot of time talking to the people who work in tourism in the area, uh, some of whom I know, 
is that it is basically an underdeveloped area so mm-hmm. that you have a few hotels and you have a, fer- a certain number of bed and breakfasts uh, and a little bit of gîte, which are homes you can rent by the week, but it doesn't have the capacity to receive people that other parts of uh, the Pyrenees Mountains do, either going east into what is called the Pyrenees Orientales, where it's much drier and much more Mediterranean, or even in the Basque Country to the west, which is actually greener and wetter, but has a much bigger infrastructure for tourism. Mm-hmm. So it's a relatively rustic area. That is true. And it's probably one of the reasons why I like it. Yeah. yeah. So the town of Foix, its emblem is uh, this magnificent, really fun, medieval fortified castle mm-hmm. that is up on a rock. Yep. And the town was, of course, built around the castle. Yeah. And uh, there'll be lots of pictures and we'll, there'll be pictures uh, that everybody can see of the castle. It's very famous. It's very famous because of its role in history. And it's also identifiable because not only is it a fortified castle, but it was it is one of the few castles that has three towers, mm-hmm. two towers that are square, yeah. that are actually from the end of the Ten hundreds, from when it was built. So it's a castle that is a thousand years old. And the third tower, which is round, which is from the 1300s. What I want to know is how did they get all those stones up there? Well, they took them (laughs) from the area around. Now, the the castle itself is built into the rock. So so it's the rock that they took right there in place? Right below. Oh, right where they, that makes sense. So basically what you have is, the, w- w- this is interesting as a, as a piece of information. The town itself goes from uh, an altitude of 358 meters above sea level, which is pretty much down below close to the river, to the, where the castle is, which is 933 meters. So you have almost 600 meters of difference in altitude from the bottom near the river to the high. It's very steep. And the town itself is closer. The town was built up around the castle, and the castle, of course, is up on this huge rock. And it's great because when you arrive, whether you arrive coming from the north or coming from the east or the west, you you see it. it. You see it. And it's one of the first things I saw my first time of living in France when I had friends in the uh, Toulouse area who took me to the countryside. Maybe that's also why I like it, because it has a kind of nostalgic association for me. I was driven with some friends into this countryside. I had no idea where I was going. And here I was, this Hmm. green American arriving in southern France who was, you know, I had no idea what was going on and how often do you get to see a castle that's a thousand years old anyway? That's true. And we <laughs> drove on this road. And at the time, the auto route between Toulouse and, and Foix didn't exist, right. which is very recent. And we arrive on this country road and we come around this bend and whoa, up on this rock, yeah. I see this incredible three-towered castle. And I thought, I've just entered fairy tale time, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was just, you know, it was kind of like that. So yeah. I've always enjoyed that. You know, yeah. I always enjoy this arrival there where you see these three towers. Yeah, it's really beautiful, you know? yeah. And anyway, so, uh, but the castle was built first and then it was built next to, I shouldn't say first because the first thing that was built is an abbey and the abbey is, st- uh, part of it is still there and that is, uh, a, it was a church and an abbey, a monastery, built along the river, and it's called saint Volusien, huh. And it's the Saint of Foix and the Ariège. V-O... V-O... V... Volusien. is V-O-L-U-S-I-E-N. Okay. Volusien. Okay. You can't correct my pronunciation this time. No, this time you're right. I got it right. I think. Okay. So, uh, and what happened was this abbey was built in the 800s, very long time ago. Yeah. And there's a wonderful, very strange story about uh, this this uh, saint who was originally from the town of Tours, which is in the Loire Valley. Yeah, it's far away. How did he get to Ariège? He well, got lost. He got lost. He was hitchhiking. He, he was lost. hitchhiking, <laughs> yes. He actually was brought there to preach to the local people to try and convert them. I mm-hmm. guess there were a lot of nice pagans hidden in the countryside in the mountains and mm-hmm. for, they, they stayed pagan probably for a very long time. Mm-hmm. They had tree spirits and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and he set up this monastery in Foix and it 
was named after him after he died. So he was the first one to actually go and Christianize the area. And so it is really, he is the patron saint of the area, saint Verdusien. And when the monastery was built, and this is often the case, the little town uh, with some traders, uh, with people who had, you know, leather and goods and, and breads and all of these other things, they built up uh, a little bit around there. And what happened was that uh, very quickly... At the same time, this area uh, was named as a county under the Franks, that is, under the descendants of Charlemagne. And you know that the term in royalty of a count, if you're a, a count or a viscount, just like if you're a baron or a duke or any of those things, well, the term count comes from uh, the, the time of Charlemagne when he decided that some of his warriors were... Uh, valuable enough to be given control over a certain region because he trusted them that they would run the region for him and they would also collect taxes. And so the person was called a count and the area was called the county. And that's why we have those names to this day. Oh, okay. And it's really thanks to Charlemagne and his idea of administration <laughs> that we have that. Next time you go to the county building, remember Charlemagne. Remember Charlemagne, <laughs> yeah. Of course, taxes have always existed since the Babylonians, so we know that he was not the inventor of taxes. So what happened was that this very, very remote area of really the extreme limits of his kingdom, uh, which goes into the, the Pyrenees Mountains, was designated a county, and they designated someone that was one of his uh, loyal servants mm -hmm. as the first count of the area and because of the monastery and because this little town grew up around it they decided to make it the count and the county of foi so before it became ariège it was foi hmm. even in in terms of the region itself okay it was the fuxien huh? yes and so it was the count of foi and starting in the 10th century that is in the 900s it became a very powerful county. It's hard to realize why. Yeah. Because when you go there now, there's hardly the anything. Yeah. But one of the reasons why is because since it's in this very strategic place mm -hmm. in what was at the time a trade route that was at the foothills of the Pyrenees yeah. that basically went east-west instead of going north-south, uh, the Romans had set up a huge trade route in the I foothills see. of the Pyrenees that went from the Mediterranean all the way to the Atlantic. And all along the way, they took strategic places that they knew they could look out for attack and that also would be places along the water so that they could use river transportation if it was feasible. I see. And they would set up these outposts, which is why it was very early... Uh, that they set up monasteries and Christian outposts because as soon as the Roman Empire fell, these other groups of people followed along the Roman road and it was cut out for them already. I see, I see. So by the time you get to the 900s, you actually have a fair amount of trade activity mm -hmm. going east and west as you go into the areas further west, which is Bayarn and then eventually the Navarre area and then Basque country, yeah. uh, all of which is really the Gascony area. You know? Some of that today is a natural park. Yes, a lot of it is uh, actually a natural yeah, park. Yeah. It's very beautiful. The, the yeah. roads in that area are very narrow and windy. And yeah, but there is the big main highway that beautiful. still runs east-west that you can yeah. go all the way from Foix to Po and further out uh, west. And so there is a nice big road that has actually cut through now that you, oh, yeah, yeah, now. you can do. Yeah. 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 So anyway, so there was this region that must have been just very important for trade because mm -hmm. it became, strangely enough, one of the richest counties in the kingdom. Wow. This is amazing when yeah, you think about it. this is really hard to fathom It's hard to today. fathom, right? Because I think it's one of the poorest areas of France It is today. one of the poorest areas of France, yeah. except for maybe the dead center of France, you know. But the other thing is that strategically, for military reasons, it was very important because there was the king of Aragon, who was on the other side of the Pyrenees Mountains, yeah. and who was constantly trying to gather uh, more land for his kingdom. So there was constant fighting on the two sides of the Pyrenees. And then you have the king of Castile and the king of Navarre. So basically, the Pyrenees, which have always served as a natural frontier mm -hmm. between Spain and France, were constantly being fought over. 
Yeah. And so this became very powerful. And what happened was it stayed in this time of uh, what we could call primitive trade and industry compared mm-hmm. to now. Mm-hmm. And those days, it was no different than a lot, of, a lot of other parts of France. So it was as rich as other parts of France. Interesting. And if you go further north, if you go out of the valley uh, and the foothills where Foix is, and you head north, you get to low-lying land, which takes you to the rich land of the valleys of the area around another town called Mirepoix. Yes. And there, it's very fertile. So they were growing a lot of wheat in that area. Mm. So, And there was also, because there's lots of running water, that's all of this meltdown from the snows of the high Pyrenees behind Foix, there were various forges. And the forges were there starting in the 800s. I see. So they produced... Metal. Metal. They produced bronze and iron, and they produced... Mm -hmm. And there was gold. Oh. And there was (laughs) gold. (laughs) And for years and years and for several centuries, people went prospecting in the area, uh, the region around Foix, in Mm. Ariège, and apparently... As far as I know, nobody does that today. They actually still do. They do? They do. (gasps) They hid it from me. But... (laughs) But the problem is, it's just, it's either people who are a little bit strange or it's people. <laughs> really? Or it's people. You are kidding me. <laughs> no, because what they go for now, you have to understand that basically, this is a little bit like the gold rush in California. The gold got used up. Well, yeah. It uh, pretty much all got taken out. Yeah. Um, but. By the time you hear about it, it's gone. But there are still some f- real fanatics who think it's fun. It's like people, I personally find the idea of standing in the middle of a river with a fishing rod, waiting for a fish to come in and bite is one of the most boring things you could possibly do in your life. (laughs) Well, there are people who will spend hours with a sifter yeah, down by the gold. water, down by the rivers, these little, 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 little rivers that lead into the Ariège. Honestly, it's more work if you're... No, I don't know which one is more work. The and and they, the, the idea, I read it recently, <laughs> that if they capture... I mean, uh, capture isn't even the right word. If they, if they find what is amounts to gold dust, literally gold dust, mm. they consider themselves to be really lucky because that's basically all that's left yeah. of, of the gold <laughs> rush that was in the Ariège. Wow. Uh, but, but it was a very important area, partly because of all the rivers mm. and partly because of the forest, which meant that they could make forges because you need a lot of wood to burn to heat up the tools to make metal. And it became a very important region and it had lots of mills on the rivers. So all foie became important because of all the activity that was going on in the, the region industry, around yeah. it. Yeah. And it was very interesting. And that yeah. takes us, of course, to the main extremely important uh, events of the early 1200s, the early 13th century, because this area, and particularly the castle in Foix, are connected to the history of this uh, War of the Qatar. Uh, this this event that is very very uh, important in uh, the destiny of the southwest of France because it's because of this that this became part of the Kingdom of France, right? And also, to be very honest and and a little bit cynical, it's become a major tourist attraction to main to name everything in this region as part of Qatar country, and Qatar is yeah. C A T H A R. Uh, so Qatars, yeah. the Qatar and the Qatar it comes from the uh, uh, it's a name that was given to them in the recent past. Nobody really knows, in fact, what they call themselves, mm-hmm. but uh, it has to do with basically what we could call a war of religion that started further east, uh, not even in France, but in uh, Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. It moved across northern Italy in the Lombardy area. It moved into Provence and uh, and landed, basically, if you will, in this part of what is now France. And what it was was a contestatory Christian movement uh, in some ways that is similar to what happened several hundred years later when the Protestant movement began, except that the Protestant movement basically lasted. It came yeah. and stayed, uh, which is why uh, in the world you have Catholics and you have various, many, many denominations of Protestantism in the world. Mm-hmm. But uh, 
one of the things that's fun uh, to do is you can do a, a tour of some of the Qatar sites in the area around and Fua. There are many, many, many. And there are many. And some of them are genuine. And some of them are not, but now they put up a sign and says Qatar country, and so it brings tourists in. But the castle in Fua, this town that existed starting in the 800s that had this magnificent, wonderful, fortified castle uh, that belonged to the Count of Fua, and the Count of Fua uh, was a very powerful man. And what happened was that in his family, in the uh, beginning of the 1200s, his Mother-in-law and his daughter-in-law were both women who were well-educated, who converted to this new religion. I see. And the count, whose name was Roger, there were lots of Rogers. Yeah. Uh, there's a Roger one, two, three, four, and they added other names to change. So you have Roger Bernard, Roger this, Roger that, but they were basically a line of Rogers that okay. were the counts of foi. What happened was... Roger, Roger. Roger. Okay. Uh, what happened was that because he was affiliated with people who had converted to this new religion, he considered it uh, his duty to help protect them. I see. And so when there's this very long war, which we uh, will talk about another time because it's very complicated, but it involved this entire region that centers around Ariège and around Carcassonne and all of this, which is the, the core of the southwest uh, of 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 what is now France, what happened was that people asked him to take his castle and not only use it to protect people that would come and basically stay in his castle for protection, but to reinforce it. Mm. So the town that you see now and the walls that are around the castle that are still there that you mm -hmm. can visit mm -hmm. are walls that were reinforced in the early 13th century at the time of this terrible religious war between the Qatar and the other people. And so what happened was uh, they built this beautiful, uh, it's now of course been renovated, there's this huge, huge walkway that's a combination of steps and ramp that take you up to the castle. The castle had a door that would close up and so when people needed to be protected, they would run and hide inside the castle, wow. which is of course what the duty of the feudal lord was anyway yeah, at the time. Yeah. And so the that castle... That was quite a hike up there. It's quite a hike. But now, you know, there's also a rampway that you can go up. Rampway? You mean a dry, someone, something you could drive? No. No, but instead of walking up steps, because the old way was up the steps. Oh, and oh, the steps oh, are The steps are in between a group no, of the medieval it. houses. But, but you can walk up a ramp that zigs and zags its way up. So even though it's still a bit of a walk, it's a lot easier to do it on the ramp than to walk up the steps because yeah. the steps are really hard on your knees and probably for some people on their hearts as well because yeah. it's really high up. Right. Well, th this is something that's worth mentioning. If you're going to go up there, don't go with a stroller. It's cobblestone. It's cobblestone. Uh, it's not possible to do with a, with a wheelchair, I don't think. No. Because it's cobblestone. It's it's uneven. Right. Yeah. But, the, you know, they have... When was the last time you were there? Probably four years ago. Because in, they renovated the muse, the castle, which is now a museum. Uh -huh. Okay, the yeah, castle. Yeah. The castle is now not only an ethnological museum, but it's a museum of Qatar. It's a museum of the history of the Ariège. Yeah. And when they renovated the museum, uh, they made the 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 stretch that is ramp a little bit easier to go up. So you, if you're a young hardy couple with a, a stroller, you can actually get up to the courtyard. But what happens is you go through the stone wall to enter into the official part of the castle. And from there on, it's all the cobblestones. So the ramp itself going up to the wall is actually a lot easier than it used to be to get in. Oh, so they smoothed it out? They smoothed it out a little bit. They okay. redid, redid a fair amount of it. They redid some of the streets in the old medieval part down below, I too. I mean, it's still steep. It's still steep. But but once you're through this the, the stone uh, wall that is the entranceway, you have to go up some more and there it's very, very it's hard because style. it's the old cobblestone. And then yeah. when you get to the top, you have a gorgeous, uh, uh, what I guess you could now consider to be a kind of outlook terrace yeah. that is at the entrance to the museum that gives you a view over the valley and over the mountains. And so it's absolutely fabulous. But yes, you obviously, uh, a wheelchair uh, cannot go up there and you cannot get 
up to the top in a car. It is impossible. No. Yeah. The parking, the closest parking you can get is where the ramp is. It's just about halfway up the ramp. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So because the, the, the town of Foix is really on, on many different levels. Uh, I don't believe, and I may be wrong, but I do not think that it is in any way uh, accessible to people who have mobility issues. Yeah. I don't believe so. Yeah. But, but part of the history of the castle is that during this whole period of time, which really lasted for just about a half a century, the Count of Foix became known. He was already a powerful, rich man, and his family, which owned all of the villages and ran, and this is feudal times, all of the villages and was uh, affiliated by marriage to the Viscounts of Carcassonne and to the Counts of Toulouse, what happened was that he was one of the last of the major nobility to resist the uh, onset of this this huge army brought down by the king of France because what the king of France wanted more than anything else was to annex this region and because it was rich yeah. in minerals and all kinds of things and wheat, make it part of the kingdom of France, yeah. whereas they used the religion as an excuse to actually create this war and invade this area. And what happened was that eventually the Counts of Foix were not killed. They were not taken hostage. But when the war ended and the army that was the French king's army eventually won, they had to leave the castle itself. And they went to one of their other castles because this is a feudal yeah. times and they had other things. And another part of the noble family took over. So what's interesting is that the Counts of Foix did not disappear. It's just that another branch of the family took I over. See. I see. And they intermarried with the royalty of the kings of France. And the Counts of Foix actually stayed in existence until the end of the 1600s. Wow. Which is longer than the Counts of Toulouse. It's longer than the Counts of... Carcassonne or of any of the other major areas yeah. and under these new and it was counts, still feudal and it was it was kind feu- of? yes it was feudal until the end of the 15th century uh there's Gaston Fabius yeah I've heard the name who was one of the most famous of the counts of Foix and by this time the family had intermarried with the family of Navarre and Béarn and all of the little kingdoms all through the Pyrenees so that you have this kind of out, I don't know how you, it's like an extended royal family I see. through the Pyrenees so that you have all of that. They all intermarried so that once they were Count of Foix, they were then Count of all of the other little kingdoms that I went see. as far as the Basque country. And then they intermarried with... Uh, the the family of the Dukes of Aquitaine, and then they intermarried with the kings of France. And of course, all of these allegiances were f- to make sure that they didn't have war anymore. You know, it's like, yeah, I'll Hopefully. give you my daughter, you give me your son, and therefore... We we'll, don't fight. We'll, we don't fight. We don't fight. No. <laughs> so uh, it stayed that way, actually, uh, for a long time. But this part of France was one of the last parts, not... Toulouse, but this part around Foix was one of the last parts to officially become a part of the Kingdom of France. Because it's in the boonies. Because <laughs> nobody, yeah, but interestingly <laughs> enough, by virtue of making all of these marriages and alliances with the other little kingdoms in the Pyrenees, it seems like they, they stayed they strong. Stayed strong mm. So that, believe it or not, Good they name. became part of France in 1679. Wow. Which is really late because it's under Louis XIV. Yeah, yeah. Which is already really, really late because because Toulouse became part of France in 1279. Yeah. That's that's 400 years earlier. Yeah. So they have a <laughs> really wonderful, rich history. And it's great. If you go into the museum, you see the history of the region. You see the history of the tool making of the area. You have a lot of all of this stuff. So it's really kind of fun because it gives you, again, maybe it's just from an American point of view, but it reminds me of all of the stories I read as a kid that had to do with feudal times in the Middle Ages. Oh, definitely. You can definitely imagine it. Just seeing that castle, you know, and walking up the castle. I mean, it is a bit of a hike, but it's very well worth it. It's very well worth I it. I think it's, you know, if you can manage it, do it. And, and the town is very, it's, the, the old medieval part is very small. 
I would say it's about seven or eight square blocks. But mm -hmm. what they've done in the recent past is they've tried to fix it up and, and make it a little bit more attractive because it was just this really yeah. old kind of run down town. And it's gray. The weather is gray a lot of the time there. Yeah, well, don't try and convince people not to go. <laughs> uh, it, it rains a lot there. I it mean, rains a lot. Clean. But it rains so a lot just like in Basque country. Nice. Yeah, yeah. But it, in the summer, I think it'll be very nice if you have a nice weather day you know but under the rain it's a little bit gloomy. well it, all of the foothills of the pyrenees unless yeah. you go to the part that's closest to the mediterranean is a is it's, very it's wet, wet. Yeah, it's, it's very wet. wet but it is in fact that i personally think the nicest time to go to this area is in september and october because you don't have a lot of rain you have gorgeous gorgeous colors because it turns golden everywhere in the hills yeah and uh, you have a, a vision of the beginning of the mountains and then you can see the mountains in the distance that may already have a little bit of snow on them and there are absolutely wonderful things to do so let's talk a little bit because besides well, visiting the castle yep. they have a couple of times a year wonderful markets in foie that are the original old well, they have style a pageant too don't they they have a they have a music festival. They have a sound and light show in yeah, August. Yeah, that's what I'm about. That meant by talks pageant. about the building of the castle and the Qatar Wars. Yep. But one of the things that I've gone to the first I'm, time I by haven't accident. I've seen the pageant ever. Have you? I have seen the lights. I haven't seen the actual pageantry where they dress up in the medieval costumes. Yeah. But they do have a regular sound and light show that lasts for about four weeks I in see. the summertime. But what I was going to talk about was not that, but they have a huge agricultural fair. Uh huh. And uh, it reminds me of the kind that you see still some places in the States, because this is what it was like probably way back in the Middle Ages, where all of the people who have the animals yeah. in the mountains bring them down <laughs> and they show them off. Yeah. And these are the bulls that they're going to sell and the cows and the, yeah. the milk and the cheese. And I have been to Foie twice when the whole town is filled up with this enormous agricultural fair. And that includes people who bring their honey because there's lots of honey mm. that's made in the mountains and their cheeses and all of these goods. And then you get the animals and you get all mm. of these real, real farm people from the mountains who come in, you know, with their carved wooden sticks. I just think it's, a, it's wonderful, yeah. you know, and all of these old kinds of things that you would they barely see anymore show, yeah. they put on a really good show and it fills up because Foix being the county seat has all these administrative buildings it has a big hospital it has part of the two-year part of the university but the whole town gets filled up with the agricultural fair and you kind of can hear the mooing from far away you know <laughs> as you go in I, I just really love it you know yeah. it's really one of those things uh, I've never um, been at that time so so they have the they have the sound and light show they have um uh, one of the other things that they have, and I made a list because I, I thought it would be fun. Uh, the, they have a music festival in May, and that's the Gabriel Fauré Festival. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, the festival because he was actually from Parmier, but he is considered to be the most important uh, composer to come from the Ariège region. Yeah. And so they have a music festival that has some of the concerts in Foix and some of the concerts in Pamier. And you know what? I don't know if I'll be able to play it at the closing of the show, but it, because I might not have the, you know, I might not find an old enough recording that it's uh, open. But if I do, I will play it. But there's this piece called Le Cantique de Jean Racine uh -huh. by Gabriel Fauré. It is the most exquisite piece of music I think I have ever heard. Really? Oh, yeah. It is marvelous. I, do, I, don't, I have to admit that I know his music a little, but I don't know his music very, very much. Oh, but that, I, that one is like the, the top hits of Jean-Gabriel Fauré. Uh -huh. it's, it's wonderful. Now, there are lots of music. This is what makes this interesting. You have this, these incredible agricultural fairs where I really get a kick out of it, but that's because I'm such a city, city person. In July... There is an international festival of documentary film Oh, that is very important because this is a festival of films that are about uh, political things, about things that are going on in the world. And people come from all over to present their films because if the films 
are given a certain amount of attention and receive some awards, mm -hmm. then they're picked up and shown in other places. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So people like to go there for that as well. Yep. Now that is just the festivals. The other thing that uh, is wonderful about being in Foix is that it is a wonderful place to go out and visit things in the area. And uh, one of the major things that you can do besides just hiking, which of course is a major thing to do, yeah. you can, in the winter, of course, there's a lot of skiing. There's a lot of cross-country skiing. And if you go further in towards Axletham or actually in some of the narrower valleys, you can actually have downhill skiing. But the hiking is, of course, one of the most important things to do. And you have the caves. Now, yeah. This area, besides being famous for medieval times, is famous because in the last glacial period, which is about 12,000 years ago, mm -hmm. about 15,000 years ago, to up to 12,000 years ago, one of the few areas that was very mild was the region of the foothills of the Pyrenees. That's all right. And so a lot of the human activity centered in around this area. And because of the geological formations, and because there is a lot of limestone, there were enormous numbers of caves. Right. And because of the caves, a lot of human activity took place there, and there are remnants of this activity. So in the region, right around Foix, and really close by, not only do you have towns with medieval castles and beautiful things like that, but you have several of the most important sites that have drawings, footprints, and indications of activity from prehistoric times. Yeah. Now, there's also a park. Yeah, the, the Parc de la Préhistoire. The Parc de la Préhistoire. That's, that's one is pretty cool, actually. It's I've been very, to that one. very, very good. If it's you, really if nice. If you have kids 5 to, to 14, 15... Right. It would be really interesting for it's them. It's wonderful. And and what it is is that the, the local, uh, there are several famous prehistorical archaeologists and uh, the members of the local tourist community uh, decided when it was made, this is now about 15 years ago, it was just opened about 15 years ago, uh, they decided to invest. They got money from the federal government. I know the story about how this came to be. And they decided that they wanted to attract more people, but also because a lot of these caves are not easy to access if you're not someone who has a lot of, uh, if you're not very agile, mm -hmm. uh, they decided to try and make this park. They got millions of euros and they got some of the money from the European community. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they took this huge stretch of, uh, of, it's a big piece of land. It's 15 hectares, which mm -hmm. means it's about 35 acres. And it's in the bottom of the valley but it's right near where a couple of these real caves are and so what they did was they made a building and inside the building they reproduced on a much smaller scale so that you can walk around it like a diorama they reproduced the network of caves that are the most important caves in the area and that is with the cave of neo mm -hmm. that's uh, the one that's my favorite and, one and, and neo is La Grotte de Nio. It, it is absolutely fabulous, and it's uh, it's a cave that is extremely big. You have to walk in almost a kilometer, 850 meters to yep. be exact, to get to the part of the cave where you actually see the drawings that are on the walls of I mean, these I, animals. I, I was there very recently. Right. Obviously, they're making a big effort in that area to to attract more tourism, and they hire these nice young looking, you know, nice looking young ladies who speak decent English and who are very smiley, friendly, welcoming, all of that, which, which, you know, in some parts of France that you don't see that very much. Um, and so it was very fun. And it's one of these caves that's unusual because it is not developed. So no. inside you have a very short section of like sidewalk with, uh, with, railing. with a railing, but otherwise you're walking on the cave bottom and everyone gets a flashlight. A lamp. A lamp, right. Flashlight, lamp. Same. You put it on your head. No, you, you hold it in your hand. Oh, they used to put it on your head. No, this one, oh, I, I was there just a few months ago. It's, okay. it's handheld. Each person gets a flashlight and that's the lighting. That's the only light. You don't, they don't have big lights in there. They, once you approach the area where um, the, the paintings are, they will turn on LED lights for a, a minute or two. Right. And that's it. And that's it. 
So it's, it's uh, because they don't want, and also you have to book. They only t- take so many people per day. Right. Otherwise, it, they, they would run into problems with all the breathing and all that. And also, the other thing you have to know is, not only is it kind of not very bright in there. Since it's you, very uneven. It's uneven. It's wet. So you need to go with good shoes. It, again, if you have mobility issues, we um, we took a friend to another uh, cave um, uh, because she has MS. So she has, uh, you know she's not very stable on her legs sometimes <clears throat> and so but we couldn't take her to that one right because you sometimes you have to bend and walk at the right. same time you know it's a little bit but it's so worth it it is gorgeous it, it is um neo is a cave uh and there are very few it's left n-i-a-u-x n-i-a-u-x yeah the the cave of neo which will very soon no longer be open as much as it is to the public you think so? No. Yeah, I know for sure. Um, it is one of the few caves left that has that not... That would be sad. It has not so been fun. fixed up on the inside. And because uh, the the work that is on the walls, which is mostly drawings in, in black, but there are some marks, there are some signs and marks as well, it is one of the few that has been left untouched. However, there is an enormous amount of calcite that is starting to cover all the drawings. And even though they limit the number of people per day to go in, uh, the uh, amount of toxicity inside has made it such that I know for a fact that they are talking now about closing it down and probably within the next 10 years, it will no longer be open to the public, just like all the other original caves, except yeah. for a couple like Peshmel in, in the lot. Now, part of the thing about Neo is that the part that's open to the general public is only about a, a third part. of yeah. what the cave actually has. Right. And I happened to go several years ago uh, when there was uh, and the anniversary of the opening of the cave. Uh, they opened up for people who were in, um, in the business, if you wish, uh, uh-huh. to apply to be allowed to go in on a special guided visit to another part of the cave. Uh-huh. And I did that. Wow. And uh, uh, you, they emptied, they actually siphoned off the water in one of the other parts of the cave because there were two parts that are perpetually flooded. Uh, flooded yeah. And they siphoned off the water and you had well, to wear cave, knee-high I mean, boots. Right, the cave itself is not all flooded. It's just that the access goes down into a flooded area. It goes, in, but the, the, yeah, but the part that we go, that the part that traditionally everybody goes to is is often wet because of the seepage. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the other part of the cave that is uh, off to the other side uh, is actually further down below, and it actually links up to an underground river. Mm -hmm. So there are two parts that are actually permanently uh, or almost permanently underwater, enough water so that they had to actually siphon it off. So it wasn't just like the water that's wet when you go into the part that most people go into in Neo. And they just did it once. Uh, they, They do it occasionally when... Uh, special archaeologists have to do some research because yeah, yeah. normally what they do is they actually dive into the water and go underground to go and look at the things. And this time they did that. But it's a really special cave. And it's a cave uh, that is uh, across the valley from another cave called Lavash. And uh, I haven't seen that one. And and that is uh, interesting because... Lavash, the cow. The cow, right. And it's actually literally on the opposite side of the valley. You From the uh-huh. entrance to Neo, you can look across to see where it is. And the difference is that Neo is a cave like most of the caves that have any kinds of uh, drawings, engravings, or anything like that that is a place where it is assumed that they did some kind of ritual ceremonies. Nobody lived in Neo, but right. they lived in Lavash. Oh, they and, did. Yeah, and Lavash is because, in fact, the, the, the Lavash is actually, it's, it's called a cave, but it's really an outcropping in the sense that I see. Uh, it's uh, the places where people lived were never totally closed off with absolute black. They were open to the outside so that they actually did have torches that they uh, apparently, you know, even 25 million, uh, 25,000 years ago, they, they used animal fat that they burned to, to make light, to make fire and have torches. But they always lived in places where 
there was never a question of suffocation, that they could have mm, access mm. to open air. And the vash is interesting. It's very small, but you can see where some of the um, fire was that they used, uh -huh. that they've managed to preserve, and they have a little part of it that's like a museum where you have the little objects that were found. Oh, cool. And uh, it's really cool. Yeah. Because you have uh, whistles, you have lance handles, you have uh, spear pieces. Most of everything was carved out of bone. Yeah. Uh, and it's very beautiful. And a lot of yeah, the objects are really to, I'll beautiful. I have to go to that one, but I often go when I have friends who are visiting and you is so spectacular that it's hard to not go to that one. You know, you know but just, you can do both in the same day. You probably can. Think of that the next time. Yeah. Because uh, the difference between Lavash and Neo is that Lavash, you don't have to reserve ahead of time. Yeah, okay, you can just so show you up. You can just show up. And I, oh, so uh, that's a good suggestion. It's if a people really good thing to do. can't get into Neo because they didn't reserve early enough, maybe... They can go across can and go at least get an idea. And, and it, it's very interesting because when you... Okay, this is a place where I'm assuming you need a car. I don't you, know you need a you, car. how you can get there. You cannot get way. there without a car, no. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a really nice thing to do. And it's really easy to do both of them in the same day. Yeah, so okay. The, uh, and now, the Park of the Préhistoire, though, which is interesting, is like if you have kids, it's wonderful because besides having... A, a reproduction that you can just look at of what's inside the cave of Neo, which includes everything, including the parts that are not open to the public. They hire young people to, uh, especially in the summer months, to, they have different places that are uh, outside where they have things set up to look like what they think people looked like and, and the activities they did in the prehistory. Right. Uh, so they have people making fire. They have people scraping skins to make clothing. They have pottery. people making tools and pottery. And uh, it's a really fun place to take children. Yeah. And the audio it. guides are really good because they are set up so that when you go through the museum, because there's more to the museum than just the uh, reproduction of the Cave of Neo, it automatically goes on and off in each room. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to I punch see. numbers. And it's in about six or seven different languages. So it'll just follow you. So it's really you fun to do. And I have been there uh, a couple of times with young people. Uh, young people meaning, you know, more high school age. But still, I mean, even younger people and young kids would really like it. Yeah, it's I it's think, really fun to yeah. do, you know. After five years old, I think you'll get something out of it. You'll get something out of it. Yeah, yeah, under than that, I don't think you can do yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but besides these, there are other things in the area that make it so interesting because it's an area filled with caves. There's another cave, by the way, called Bediak. I don't know if you've ever been to it. No, I have not. It's it's closer to B E D I uh, B E D E I L H A C. Okay. It's much closer to the Parc of the Préhistoire and to Tarascon. Okay. And uh, it has some footprints and handprints from people from the same time period as Neo, uh -huh. and some marks and engravings on the wall. But also, it's just a fun cave to visit if you are interested in visiting a cave and don't want to be in a narrow space because it's famous because the opening of it is so huge that during World War II, little planes landed inside it. Oh, wow. <laughs> and the Germans actually used the cave to store arms. Wow. And uh, there's a photo you can pick up that maybe we can find and, and put on, on, uh, um, on the website to yeah. show that shows a little airplane inside the entranceway. It's the photo is taken from inside looking out. Wow. So you have the light behind the plane and, uh, that also has guided visits. And one of the things about all of these caves is that, uh, in, in none of these caves, none, uh, you are allowed to do a visit without a guide. Oh yeah. It doesn't exist. And that is because they don't want people touching the walls. They don't exactly. want people uh, ruining things. So everything, even the caves that don't have prehistoric art, you can only go in on a guided visit no yeah. matter what. But besides the caves with prehistoric art, there are two others in the area, one of which I've been in a couple of times, uh, that are enormous. It's an it's a region that's famous. So speleologues, people who like to explore caves, love to go in. Yeah. Spelunking. They love to go in this area. And one of those caves is called Lombrive. Yes. And it is uh, considered to be the most enormous underground cavern in Europe, open to the public. Wow. It has 25 different guided tours. Wow. Based on uh, 
uh, mineralogy based on uh, plants, based on the history of underground rivers and things like that. I have only done one or two of them. So I have no idea what the others are like. Well, you're ahead of me. <clears throat> I haven't been. See, that's my problem. Whenever I go to those areas, I go with friends. And, and you I go back to the same thing. I take them to the places I know, which I should stop doing that and go see the other and you should. And this one you would like too, because every once in a while in this cave of Lombrive, which is in the town. L-A-M. L-O-M. Lombrive. L-O-M-B-R-I-V-E-S. Okay. Uh, in the summertime, they do a few music concerts inside. Ooh, that would be very nice. And I went to one once. Mm. And it is a little bit creepy. It's a, you know, <laughs> it's a little bit creepy. I mean, there's this kind you know, it's, it's so enormous inside. And, and you have this flute and, and uh, uh, I can't remember. There was like three or four instruments. And there's a kind of, you know, eerie, eerie quality to it. But it's really, really, really interesting to do. Huh. And right nearby... In the same zone, because all of this is near Usat Les Bains, which means it's right afterwards uh, on the same road, right there. Yeah. You have a cave called La Bouiche. Yeah. And it's a cave that has an underground river. Yes. And you go in and you go on a boat. Oh, that one's on a boat. Yeah. Okay. You actually, okay. it's like, it's a, like, it's like at uh, Padirac. You actually yes. go on a boat and you go on a ride on this underground river inside this cave. So, uh, and of course, uh, if, if, Somebody out there doesn't like caves. Forget any of these things. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, this is really. But the truth is that there's all of this stuff to explore and visit. And the only one where you really have to be warned about whether you're claustrophobic or not, and whether you have a good sense of balance or not, is Neo. Uh, now, I happen to know one of the people who was one of the main guides at Neo, and who has been the chief guide there for for forever and ever, mm -hmm. and. Um, there was a time when I was taking groups into Neo a lot. And so it's one of those places where uh, in, it has happened in the past. They have had accidents where people have slipped. Uh, it's very easy to slip. Um, if somebody uh, breaks a leg or somebody twists an ankle, uh, the problem is that in caves like that, you have to haul them out. And because this is a cave that's so special because it's one of the few caves that has all the original stuff and nothing has been changed on the inside, they started having problems with uh, people having accidents. And now the policy is if anybody has any problem, the whole group has to leave. Mm. They can't leave the group unassisted without another guide. And they only have one guide go in at a time. So yeah. uh, I have uh, had the experience, unfortunately, of having a couple of people who were walking with canes and were very unstable, and we really had to tell them that it would not be possible yeah, for them to go inside. Yeah, if you need a cane, you shouldn't go. You it, shouldn't go. You, you have to have good balance. You really have to. And yeah. even with good balance, you will probably slip and you will catch slip. yourself. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, it's, it's, not, it's not made for tourism. No, there it's just There are areas not. where there's like you know, areas where you could fall and hurt yourself. And it's not like in America where they put ramps and right. they put, you know, these are places where you could seriously hurt yourself. You could seriously hurt yourself. Uh, yet it's not protected. They trust the tourists. They're not as afraid of lawsuits, right. I guess, as uh, they are in America. That is true. Uh, but you have to be warned. But you have you to know. be warned. And, of course, they're assuming that, uh, well... The other thing is, of course, that I'd say more people do more uh, physical activity in France in general. And there are yeah. a lot of tourists that come from other countries. So all of this is in the region around Foix. And just to mention, aside from that, you also have very close to Foix, you have two thermal stations, not even an axe like them. You don't have to go that far. In usset les bains and Olus les bains which are right near where Lombrive and La Bouiche are. Mm -hmm. So that is right after Tarascon. So this is 15 kilometers from Foix. So it's very close by. Uh, and so, so these are natural baths. These are natural no baths. and hot baths right. and that. Yeah. Except that they have, you know, buildings. I mean, when people right. talk about going into the baths. But, but because this is a region of underground rivers and caves and everything, you have a lot of this wonderful natural activity besides the fact that you have all these castles and things like that. And again, it's a region that is really good for tasting certain foods. There uh, is, the, of course, uh, the famous charcuterie of Ariège, which is very, very good, which is lots of different kinds of hams and, and yeah, things like cuts. that, cold cuts. And they have uh, 
the 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 cheeses in this area, interestingly enough, are mostly cow. You have mm-hmm. Betmal, Moulis, and uh, Bamarus, hmm. which are three wonderful Pyrenees cheeses, but are cow cheeses, not sheep cheeses. Hmm. Uh, you have a lot of honey. I buy my honey in yeah. Ariège, and it's absolutely wonderful, good, strong honey. And a famous... Uh, uh, the Custade de Pomme, which is very similar to one we hmm. talked about when we talked about whatever we talked. I can't remember when we talked about well, it. We le, talked about the, le pastis de, the pastis, de, de uh, the Gascogne. Yeah. And uh, a drink, which is, eh, I don't particularly like, but is really from this area. <laughs> and that is called Hippocras. Oh, disgusting. Uh, some people love it. It's mm. a sweet, spicy wine that is actually the... the um, a vestige of Roman times because it was the Romans that invented it. They used to take wine, they mixed it with the local honey, honey. and they added spices and uh, they still produce it there. Now, some people I think might like it. You know, there are people if who you really like super like, sweet, super, super not sweet. natural wine. Right. <laughs> but anyway, it's really kind of fun to at least get a taste of it while you're in this area because it's really something produced still in this area that wow. goes back very, very so far. So we have yeah. covered a lot of ground there. We've covered a lot of ground and but- it's, I really think it's a cool area to visit. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot to do for for maybe a three day weekend or something. For definitely, you, know, you need and, a little time. And if and people, if people are serious hikers, no, yeah, you can go there, for, go to this area for a week. Yeah. And between the natural things to do and the visiting of Foix or visiting the little villages, and one other thing, or cycling. I mean, if you one like other thing I didn't mention, hills. it's not quite. It's a little bit outside of Foix, but it's really. Really interesting and worth going to. It's called Les Forges du Pyrene. Yes. And it is now a museum site that is on the one of the roads leading out of uh, Foix. Yeah. And it shows the forges the way they used to be in the ancient times. And they still have people working there. So you get demonstrations of how they used to make me- metallic things. Well, that would be a with- good place to go for training. For you want to do that? Well, no, but I mean, if you show up there on a rainy day and you don't want to go oh, do the oh, if it's raining, I thought you said if you want training. No, no, not training. I don't need that. <laughs> yes, it's a wonderful place to go on a rainy day, and it's also a place to go on a nice day because we went on a day when we had a picnic, mm. and we the demonstration includes all the old uh, ways of making. Things out of ceramics, out of metal, out of wood. It's fascinating. It's great for children. <laughs> Lots of animation. And it's very pretty. So you can go if it's raining or you can go on a nice day and do a picnic. So it's a really nice area to be Wonderful. in. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Elise. You've hit it out of the park again. <laughs> I want to go back. <laughs> yeah, you're inspiring me to go back and see these places. I'll I go with seen. you. Come on, we'll so... go and see them together. Okay, that sounds good. All right, well, um, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you. Uh, Like I mentioned at the beginning, I am very thankful to all of you who uh, wrote us iTunes reviews. We haven't read out any of them in in quite a few shows, so it's about time for us to get back to it. But we did get our first negative review. So should should we read the positive ones or the negative one first? Read the positive one first. Positive ones first, okay. Here I go. Here I go. Some we get like we got a lot of reviews and they're they're wonderful. Okay, so somebody called Upanizo says, "Love it, can't keep it down. I'm so glad I found your podcast. I listen every day while driving to work. I can't keep it down. I hope he means the volume. I hope he means the volume. Yeah. <laughs> <Or she. laughs> your podcasts are very." informative and detailed oriented loved your episodes on Notre Dame and Saint Chapelle my family and I will be traveling to Paris this fall and I will definitely put in practice all the wonderful te- tips I've learned while listening to both of you thank you thank you thank you Upanizo uh, somebody called oof this is a hard one Ishka by 
Bowl 66. <laughs> um, merci beaucoup, mesdames. I would like to respond, respond on behalf of computer listeners. Oh, you remember when I said that we should that a podcast shouldn't be listened to exactly. while uh, exactly. sitting at a computer. That's right. I got, I got told off for saying that. Apparently, that's what she's about to do. She says, um, I enjoy listening to Join Us in France while I'm at work. Ah, some days I can escape and picture myself in France traveling along. I also get inspiration to keep following my educational path, even though I'm 48 years old. Well, it's never too late, is never it? Never too late. Thank you, ladies, again for such a wonderful podcast. And, okay, next one. Uh, somebody says, Judy Ann 33. Perfect. These podcasts do a great job of describing the sites and what one might experience on a visit there. Helpful for a new visit and fun to remember a past one. Well, of course. Of yeah, course. that's great. Um, uh, D Declore. Declore. Oh, I... D-C-L-A-W... DC lawyer, I'm sorry. DC lawyer. DC lawyer. <laughs> so bad. Um, an excellent source of information and inspiration. I recently discovered this podcast while I was visiting France. Huh? I have been visiting France at various times for different lengths at, uh, of time for, um, for almost 40 years. I have relatives in France and speak French. I have been devouring the back episodes. The hosts have taught me much about French history and motivated me to explore more of France. Wonderful. Yeah. This podcast covers much more than how to get there and when to go. The American hosts, that would be you, seems really seems to know French history very well. And I love this. See, that's great. In the future, I hope they will do a show on being a vegetarian in France. Well, we could try. Although it's certainly possible. It seems harder than in the USA. It is. Yes, it is. <laughs> And we, we should talk about it at some point. Highly recommended. Merci. Um, it's Z says, top notch. I'm very happy to have found the Join Us in France podcast. These ladies are informative, entertaining, and honest. They have uh, many helpful ideas and tips that I can't wait to use on my next trip to France. Merci. Um, Skash. Skashly Nicole says, awesome audio tour. I really love the Join Us in France travel podcast. My husband and I are planning a trip to Paris and likely Chartres after hearing that episode for September. And this podcast has been invaluable in planning. Elise and Annie provide great perspectives for tourists and are both well-spoken and knowledgeable about each topic. I think that I will return from our trip and go right back to listening and planning my next trip around their information and stories. Isn't that wonderful? That's wonderful. Okay, so the, the last positive one for today. Uh, um, Dana Point, Steve Dana Point says, uh, I just learned of this podcast from listening to a recent podcast on This Week in Travel. Yes, we have appeared on that show, which was lovely. This was the first one in the series I have listened to. I thought I knew information about champagne, but I did learn. The pair of podcasters are interesting and easy to listen to in this format. I recommend it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We are so grateful that you took the time to write a review. And, and we did get a negative review. Which we did. It's not it's the end of the world. It's kind of inevitable. Yeah, it's bound to happen. I mean, if the only... What is the saying? If you don't want people to criticize you, don't never do anything? Or That's something? right. That's right. I mean... That's something like that. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so somebody says uh, Carbonet. Uh, on, that's on the UK store. iTunes separates the reviews by country. by country. And so we got a ton of reviews in the US store. But in the UK store, we just have that one review. And it's negative, which is kind of unfortunate. It says, to spend three podcasts on a subject that they tell us when listening will take just two hours and the real recommendation is to walk around the outside is a waste of time. The discussion is really short on facts, except for finding toilets. <sighs> well, normally I wouldn't even, you know, it's not in my nature to point out negative things. But seeing that this is the only review we got in the UK store, it's really visible. And I would totally love if UK listeners could go to iTunes, 
write us a review and give us give it some counterbalance. Yeah. You know, if you disagree, please go write what you think is what I'm saying. Um, because we can't respond. You know, it's not, that's not how iTunes work. So, you know, be nice. No, no. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, everybody's entitled to their opinion. Of and course. a couple of times, maybe there have been a couple of errors about a specific date or something like that. I mean. Or the name we, of a queen. We are not. Robots. We're not 100% perfect. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think that we do a fair amount of research. And uh, yeah. this is work that is not, we don't just do for the podcast. This is, you know, part of what I I do actually as a living. Yeah. So, uh, but if somebody doesn't like our style, they don't like our style. That's but right. I'm sure that most of you out there do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening probably. So thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. If you would like to show us even more, more love, go to jonasandfriends.com forward slash Amazon before you make any purchase on Amazon. It won't cost you a penny more and it earns us a little bit of a commission. And that's always nice because we do have some costs uh, uh, having to do with the show. So thank you very much. And we will talk to you next week. We will see you again next week. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thank you.